I'm sorry, he's not giving an interview right now. Okay. Hang on. Sergeant that you produced was Ray Nard. But that was quite controversial. Oh, so, yeah, because there was homosexuality. Yeah. And, that. and then I had a little nudity in there. Uh, two people who not show a little bunch of women's breasts that were shot or something. You were not then, you don't recall then being concerned or not wanting the argument? Yeah, I was all right. What you didn't want was that other one. The X. The X, yeah. That's right. what you didn't want. And, and neither. And they, I think all of them said no X for me. You never felt it's constrained. No, I don't remember. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have any properties coming on that I did that I felt that would come close to films over the years. Then, at the time that the ratings board came into being, and still at this time, the whole purpose is to give information to parents right. about what. Right. are in those R-rated films now. For example, some of the R-rated films now would, would definitely have been X-rated in 1968 or 1970s. What, what do you think um, the industry's res response to that would be in terms of why their rating standards have changed? I haven't worked around the major studios for many years. So I don't want to think of these with the studios. Studios, Early criticism of the system that yeah. that uh, sex would much more easily get an R and X rating than violence. Oh, I see. I think yeah. That's, that's, yeah. I think the undue emphasis on action and violence. Well, obviously, you you would have to lay part of that blame on individual filmmakers, and you would have to be like part of the blame on the audiences that go to that. Sure. Is there any blame that gets put on the radio? You ready? Yeah. I'm talking to you, right? right. I'm on. In the introduction, get the door, Frank, if you will. I just want to tell her. Yeah. She's still here. Marcia Mason and Susan Swift have played the little girl. She's now married, got a couple of kids. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. In the uh, introduction to Novels into Film, we open up with the comment or the question, Novels into Film, is it a happy wedding or is it a shotgun marriage? Uh, Any comments just in general terms on how often does it work that a novel can be successfully made into a film? Any general comments on that? Well, I think I think there have been many, many books made. That one of the winners is a prime example, you know, fine, fine film. And, uh, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't consider a, a, a good novel, a good book, uh, as a prime source material for a good movie. You know, if it's a good story and a good yarn, and, and it's something that is uh, is uh, uh, basically cinematic and can be boiled down. Because one of the problems is with books, you have so much, so much uh, material, mm -hmm. and of course with a novelist, he can get inside the the character's head, and we can't do that in films. It all has to be translated into, into exchange of dialogue. And, Thoughts, unless occasionally use a voiceover like I did in the haunting, you see. But uh, do you sometimes yearn for that power to express the insides of a character? It would it would be nice if we could do it very often. I finally had to do it in the haunting, which you, you've seen. In other words, there's no way I could get over what was going on with, uh, with uh, Julie Harris, the character, and that without, without do, do, using some voiceover. Considering the sheer uh, amount of literary materials translated to the screen. Does it help if a director is also an omnivorous reader? And are you oh, one? I'm not an omnivorous reader. I used to be many years ago, but I don't do much anymore. And uh, of course, all the majors cover all the book, upcoming books and plays and everything, you know, and then have a synopsis made of it. So the producer is, uh, I'm talking about a major lot now, if he's uh, looking for a Material for upcoming shows and whatnot. He would get to, uh, the story department of the studios will send him uh, a synopsis of, uh, of a book that's coming up. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've got the galleys and whatnot. If it's something he'd be interested in, then he he will get the galleys themselves and read it and see if it's something that he that he thinks will make a good movie. Who are some of the writers that you came to rely upon as? Skilled translators of the page to the screen. Two of them, two of them, two writers, particularly one, Ernest Lehman, who did uh, 
presented Sweet For Me first, and then he did also uh, uh, Somebody Up There Likes Me, I think. Didn't he do that? And also uh, uh, West Side Story, and Sound Music. He's a, he's a fine talent. Better at, uh, better at, uh, at uh, uh, working on uh, other material, translating it, but booking the thing or playing on the screen and doing a version. Nelson Gidding is another one who's done several of my, my, uh, my shows, starting with I Want to Live, and it's four or five, I think. And he's, uh, he's the other writer with whom I've worked with, worked with the most. Mm -hmm. Now, if I can believe what I read, you first knew about the Shirley Jackson novel. The Haunting of Hill House, and then went to Mr. Gidding. Is that correct? Yeah, after after I got the uh, after I got the uh, rights to it. Yeah. Now, why did you go to Mr. Gidding? Why did you think he was the well, man? Because I had worked with him before on uh, on uh, I Want to Live, and uh, it was the first time we worked together. He did a fine job for me, and I thought he was a good screenwriter. I'm sure he would be he would be able to you know, break down the book and condense it and get it into some kind of. Uh, Shape. But is to be a good screenwriter the same thing as knowing how to adapt a novel into a film? Well, as I, I think I said earlier, I think some some screenwriters are better at originals, writing their own original screenplay. Others are better at uh, taking uh, some other some other person's material, a book or a play, uh, something, and, and turning it into a screenplay. And uh, I think they're different talents and. Uh, uh, so I, I think I think Ernie Lehman is one who is tremendously important and big talent in terms of taking some other material and turning it into a fine screenplay. He has Ernie has such respect for the, all the original material, and all he wants to do is use the best of that and maybe eliminate things that don't work and, and improve uh, uh, improve areas that maybe didn't work quite so well in the book for. Now, have you yourself ever read a book or a story and thought to yourself, this would make a fine film? I can see it on the screen already. Sure. And any examples of that? There's a book called Time and Again. Oh, yes, Jack yeah, Finney. Jack Finney. I read that book and loved it, loved it. I could never get it off the ground back in those days. Hmm. Cost, for cost reasons. One of the ones. Cost. Did, you, did you ever talk with Finney about it? No, I never did. He's very reclusive, or was. I understand, yeah. No, I never talked to him. I never had the I got the rights of the thing. I had interest in it, and I tried to, I pitched it to uh, some of the studios, but because of the, what it was going to cost a tremendous amount for those days, and they just couldn't get any interest in it, so. Well, duplicating New York in the 1880s wouldn't be cheap. Wouldn't be cheap. That was the, that was the big problem. It was just going to be too darn expensive. I thought it was a marvelous story. A marvelous story. Has there ever been a book that you wanted to film in addition to this, maybe an established literary classic that also proved to be elusive. No, I don't have any other than I, I mm -hmm. so much. Do you believe in the adage that the more inferior the book, the more likely it'll make a great film and vice versa? <laughs> I don't think that makes sense. I don't, <laughs> how could it? It's an inferior book. Um, it's, it's so interesting. Um, it's not really in, in what you what you're talking about, but so often, but uh, years years afterwards, the studio will go into remaking some film that's been made 30 years before, you know, and uh, I think they, they they always they always make something that's been very successful the first time it's done. And what they should do is look for those those uh, films that didn't handle the original material the right way, missed the boat. And should go back and remake those that, that were not done the right way from the original material, but they never do it. They always seem to want to remake the the uh, the, uh, the successful. Which brings up, by contrast, those startling moments when an obscure story, like Harry Bates's uh, Farewell to the Master, yeah. suddenly blooms forth as Day of the Earth. Yeah, sure. Tell me about the genesis of that. Did you know of that short story, or did I, it come to you? That was all developed and done by Julian Blaustein, who was the uh, producer of it. And when I came when I came on it, uh, this, the first draft screenplay was already done. Mm -hmm. My Ed the North did the screen, screenplay, and uh, so I had I had nothing to do. I didn't know I didn't know the short story. I didn't know it at all. I just when I when I got I had got a call from Daryl Zanuck one day. I was running the studio. And he said, "Think, go over and see a producer named Julian Blouse, and he's got a property. I think you might be interested." In it. it was the day this. Was, uh, I took it away, read it, flipped over it. Thought it was just absolutely marvelous. Went back and said, "Sure, this is something I'd like to do." Now, when a script like that goes into development, do you ever preside over its various stages, or do you stand apart from it? Uh, well, 
most of my films that I've done, uh, I've, I've come over and there's been a first draft script done. The producer and the, and the, and the writer, whatever it is. And, and then I go in, I read it, and then, you know, like the project and what it wanted, uh, uh, I'll pass on it. And then what I do is, is work with the writer and the producer and getting my input into the script where I think it can be helped, where I think there's, uh, there's some of the dialogue's not quite right, or where I think the added sequence is needed or some sequence is not needed. No, shaping and developing the script. I work, with the, I work with, the, with the screenwriter and the producer on that. But uh, as I say, practically all of my scripts, uh, with a few exceptions, uh, have been, uh, I've come on to whether it's the first draft script or the read time. Did your work with Val Luton give you experience with a master script craftsman like Luton? Right. I'm thinking right. of Body Snatcher, of course. Right, right. He was a, he was a tremendous talent. I mean, was just marvelous, marvelous talent. I don't think there was a single one of his films that was made in which he didn't do the final shooting draft of the script, but he would never take credit himself. He didn't want to take away from the writer. And finally we got down to, uh, it was a Body Snatcher, and uh, Philip McDonald's, uh, had done the script, original script, and then Val had worked it over to say he would never take credit. He didn't want to take away from the writer. And the writer's guild, in working it over, decided that, uh, that McDonald didn't deserve sole credit on it, that somebody else had to be on there with him because he didn't do enough of it to get sole credit. So uh, I say Val never wanted to put his own name on it to take away from the mm -hmm. writer at all. So the, if you see that sometime, you'll see uh, Philip McDonald and Carlos Keith. And that's Val Luton. I see. That's the Val Luton. K E I T H? Yeah. I'll be darned. Now, with somebody like a Michael Crichton, who nowadays is quite the cock of the walk, as yes. they say. But at the time of Andromeda Strain, I guess still a virtual unknown. Yeah, that was his, that was his first film. Uh, I mean, sorry, it was, mm -hmm. that was Michael Crichton's first, first book that got it not published. Now, what was he like to work with in those days, or did you work with him ever on that film? I didn't work with him ever on that. I didn't ask, ask him to do the screenplay. I, I, I feel very often that the original author of, of the book uh, is so tied into that material and so close to it one another that he can't see through where it needs to be changed and adapted and cut and pulled together and all which you have to do in any kind of book. You have so much material there. So I, read, I just very, I don't to look like over this, I don't think I've rarely ever use the original author to do the screenplay. Mm -hmm. A fair percentage of your work uh, is adapted from either a novel or a short yeah. story, leaving aside musical theater for the moment. Right. How do you account for that? Intent? Circumstances? Circumstances. Yeah. So just how one came. You, you do a film, you finish it, and it's shifted, and you turn it over to the studio, and then it's around for your next project, you know? It just happened the way they happen to come. Uh, have you ever seen a film made from a book where you felt disappointment, as so many viewers often do. I didn't see the character that way, they changed the ending. Have you ever had those reactions? I probably have, but I can't give you chapter and verse. Yeah. Yeah. What about the script writers you've worked with in general? In your opinion, are they writers with a capital W that deserve every bit as much respect as a novelist would? Yes, I think they do. I think they do, uh, uh, particularly if they're, writing, if they're writing an original screenplay, not if they're adapting a book or something, type of thing. I don't think, one thing, I don't think that screenwriters are getting nearly as much credit as they should be for what they contribute. It all starts with that script. You know? that's, that's where it starts, that script. If there are weaknesses in that script, too bad. Mm -hmm. You just get rid of those before you start to shoot. So it all starts with that script. And I don't think very often, so most, most often the reviewers will talk about the prefer to the director and this, that, and the other. Very, very seldom will have anything uh, beside a passing nod to the writer. And I think that's a mistake. I don't think they get nearly as much credit as they should have for anything. You are then somebody who wants that script to be absolutely, totally finished in hand before you step onto the set. Absolutely. I've had a, one occasion, particularly Star Trek, where I didn't have that ability because I had to start shooting on that before we only had the first act of the script right because they had been paying the actors for so long. And they'd been putting on hold. They first were going to make it as a big TV film and then they decided to make it in a feature. And that's when I came into it. And they had been, pay they had been paying the actors for weeks and weeks and weeks holding it for, the, for, the, for the, what was going to be a, a TV movie. And then so they told me at a certain point I had, I had to start shooting on the script, on the picture, because they'd been paying these actors for sitting around doing nothing for so long. They just said, we can't do that anymore. So they said, you've got to start shooting. Uh, 
the beginning of next month or something. So I had to start shooting with only the first act of the script right. You know? We were rewriting the thing all the way, all, all the way through, all the way through the very end. Last week or two, I was getting two, one or two sets of changes each day for the next day's work. Because all the actors had been in the series for so long, they all had an idea what they should do, <laughs> what they should say, what was right, correct dialogue for them, like that. So, uh, so that's not a, that's not a satisfactory way to work. Before I move on, do you need to stop and take a break? Are your hands falling off? <laughs> I'll just put the phone to the <laughs> Without the okay. tripod, it's... No, seriously, the rest of it, if you need to. I thought we might go from here. Actually, Frank, first. Um, I'll pop in if anything comes yeah. to mind. But I can't okay. You ready? Yeah. Okay. I'm okay. fine. Now, as an educator, I find all too often that movies are presented in classrooms as substitutes for the novel from which they were made. And there is that danger, isn't there? Yeah, I suppose so. I suppose so. It's a, it's a, well, it's a whole different form, and uh, sitting down reading that book takes more work and more <laughs> concentration than sitting back and the film come at you. Really. Is it too easy maybe to get lazy about that, look at the movie instead of reading the book, instead of doing both? I think so. I think so. Uh, unless, you're, unless you're into films, unless you're a film student or whatnot, you really want to see what happened between the book and the screenplay. How the, how the screenplay came out of the book, mm -hmm. but uh, for the average audience, uh, I suppose if they see a film that they that they like that they uh, very much and they uh, and if they're real film buffs and and they might want to go back and read the book from which it came to find out what what uh, transpired mm -hmm. and how the, how the, the film came out of that book. Essentially, that, take, that takes a real film buff. So <laughs> yeah. maybe some students might. But if we were in a classroom, and this book, of course, is intended so much for libraries around yeah. the country, um, if we were going to talk about Shirley Jackson and Frank de Folita, for example, Haunting and Audrey Rose, would it be maybe judicious of us to show the film and assign the book both? I mean, is that the proper way? Are they both different spins on the maybe the same central idea? Well, they're, they're different spins, sure. Which, which should come first? I don't know. It's an interesting thought. Whether well, you should let, have them see the film first and then read the book. I, I yeah. anguish over this every time a literary adaptation comes out. Or, or have them read the book and then see the film. Because it it's would interesting. be... Yeah. Yeah, interesting. I, I, well, once you've seen the film, you'll you always picture the people that way when you read the book. Sure. So there's one... Mm -hmm. Right. But at the same time, you read a lot of material in the book that's not in the film. And so... <laughs> What's the, what's, the, what's the answer to that, you see? Um, I, think, I think probably, uh, and then read the, look at the film first, and they're sufficiently caught up in the, in the film, and it's and curious enough, and we'll film, let's go back and read the book and see mm -hmm. how it got into the form that they've mm -hmm. seen on the screen. I suppose the most protest that goes up from viewers and or readers is when substantial changes occur from page to screen. Have you in your own work made or seen drastic changes from book to film? Not, uh, not drastic. And drastic. ever been attacked for it or criticized no, for it? No, not drastic. Uh, but when I was doing a, a drama strain, uh, Nelson Gidding was doing the screenplay on it, and he came in to uh, see me one day in the office as he was working on the screenplay, and he said in the, the original, Tritons, but there were four sides. Hmm? Mm -hmm. They were all men. And he said to me, um, uh, what would you think if we took the character of Dutton and um, made it into a woman? And I said, get the hell out of here. I can see it now. Raquel works in the submarine. And I said, no, 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 wait. Wait, hear me out. And he described the kind of woman that uh, he thought, an older woman, you know, who's was on that science and all that. He said he thought it would make it an interesting, different balance of it. And I was, uh, I was the tree, but I didn't want to, uh, uh, I didn't want to, uh, to, uh, to um, antagonize the scientific community. So I knew a couple of scientists who had read the book, and I called them and asked them if they would have any problem uh, if we took this, uh, this character, Dutton or whatever it was, and made it a woman, described the kind of older woman scientist in front of them. said, oh, no, 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 so we have more. Well, we decided to solve every day, and that would not bother us one bit if you if you made that character into a woman. And to Kate Reed played it, if you see that. And she was the most interesting character in the force. She was marvelous the way Nelson wrote her, the way, the way Kate played it. 
It is saying record and not pause, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you didn't push the red. Just occurred to me. Oh, no, I, can, I, I do look from time to time because that would be a disaster, wouldn't no, it? Because you have to push that red. You know, something I just thought of, and I checked it to make sure that I was thinking right. Among the unrealized projects, I've always found this fascinating. In two consecutive years, you considered doing the Bobsy Twins and then a spy in the House of Love, the Anais Nin. Anais Nin, yeah. Um, which I thought, well, that's what, about it, I can't remember what could possibly be less like each other than the Bobsy <laughs> Twins? <Yeah. laughs> and the, you know, I, I, I've been accused by some of the uh, more esoteric critics of not having a, a Robert Wise stamp on my film, you know, trademark, like a Hitchcock or something like that. My, my answer to that has always been, I've done every genre there is. I know what it is. Uh, and I approach each picture and each genre in a cinematic style that I think is right for that film. And uh, I wouldn't have approached the sound of music as I did. I want to live for anything. You know? So that's why uh, that's my answer to people saying they don't have a stick to the <laughs> style. Of it. I mean, John, the batteries. Okay, let's substitute a new battery. Okay, fine. Yet I can imagine hardly anything less prepossessing than the Bobsy Twins. I read those as a yeah. kid. What, what got into your head there? I don't know. It's too Why long. Not? It's too long ago. <laughs> I can't tell you. Maybe some of my associates or somebody came up with a thought about it and had an angle on it. I it was too it. long, too long ago. Sure, I love it. Yeah. Well, a book like this is supposed to come to people who maybe have never thought about the fact that their favorite movies might have had a book behind mm -hmm. them. I gather that you do believe strongly that it's not an incompatibility to go from a book to a movie. You, you, it, it can be done. Absolutely, sure it could be done. Sure it could be done. They're all stories. You tell stories on the screen. Mm -hmm. And sure, you could do it and get a, get a good book. I mean, many, many good books have been, have been put on the screen, you know. Well, other books. I can't give you chapter and verse of them all, but Long uh, with the Wind is a prime example of it, of course. And so, uh, uh, sure, that's, that's a wide, good book wide open for it. Material. And to somebody who says, oh, the movie can never be as good as the book, you must have had that one thrown at you a few times. Well, it's, it's, a, it's just a different artistic form, isn't it? It's just a different form. Uh, your, your, your movie cannot get everything on, on the screen that's in that book because you can't get it inside of people's heads unless you do an occasional thing, voiceover and all that. You can't get all the, you can't get all the exposition in. So it, it, it takes a very skilled screenwriter to take a, a, a book, a popular book, a good book, and translate it into the script form of like a good movie. It's a, it's a very it's a definite art. I've been looking about your desk. I can't help but notice what appear to be scripts. Oh, they've not been there for years. <laughs> this, one I, this one I'm just evaluating for the lady who's written it, and, I, and I've uh, agreed to read it and give her any thoughts I have on this. Is, New screenwriter. Maybe I can conclude with this. When you look at a script or reading a story, in your mind's eye, have you developed an ability to make a film of it right then, in your mind at least? Well, I ask myself several things when I read a piece of material, whether it's a book or a screenplay or whatever. Is, uh, of course, number one is it has a story to catch me up. You know, is it something that, because uh, uh, as a reader, I'm an audience. You know, I'll be the audience is going to see this film. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it, uh, is it, uh, is it, uh, Something that is a history story and plot and characters and all that, that, that that's going to, going to hold up on the screen. Number one, uh, I say this is whether it's a screenplay already or, or a book or a play. Uh, number two, if it's not a screenplay, or if it's a, is it cinematic? Is, there, is, is, is it a material that would, with work, be able to be turned into something that's cinematic in terms of, of the movie? You know? And by cinematic, a, a variety of scenes. Maybe? Yeah, you know, just the just the uh, just the, uh, the the locale of the story, and where it's going to be, where it's going to take place, and, uh, it's going to be on location, it's going to be abroad, it's going to be where, you know, mm -hmm. uh, all of that. Uh, and what, what what I can put up on the screen in terms of the visuals. And then the third thing I have to ask myself is what's it going to cost? Because that's the first thing the front office will ask me when I go up to the province. Say, well, what do you think you can make this for? So those are the steps that I've been through. Okay. I think I will sneak in one last one, if I may. Frank and I were talking about the, the relative dearth of good ghost stories on film. And The Haunting, of course, comes to mind in Audrey Rose. Is it really tough to visualize on screen what is essentially intangible, like Shirley Jackson's apparitions? I've had so many people say to me over the years, Mr. Wise, you made the scariest movie I've ever seen. You didn't show anything. 
all by suggestion, all by suggestion. And that goes way back to Mal Newton, who said the greatest fear of people have fear of the unknown. What's that noise back there? Isn't it? See that in the shadows over here? What's that? What's that? That kind of thing. Play on that. That came from Val Luton, who you know, with whom I started directing. When the camera dollies in on that wallpaper, did you play a trick on us? Did you dissolve into an image in the wallpaper, or do we really see a pattern emerging of what looks to be a face? I think, I think, I think, I think that we dissolved it <laughs> too long ago. We have little voices behind there, really. Yeah. And that, but, uh, those are fun kind of, that's a fun kind of film to make. Yeah? Now, is yeah. that the kind of thing that only the film medium can do as opposed to prose? I think so. I think so. Except, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Because when you read, when you read a book. Okay. Yeah, there's the, uh, the, story, the story you told me when I first, inter no. No, go ahead. When no, I first okay. interviewed you about the haunting I'd say probably seven or eight years ago in New York at your club there. I remember oh, right, yeah. I came to, uh, and you told me a great story about the first time you were reading The Haunting. Yeah, that's the, uh, and that I might, tell that, that might be relevant, yeah. please. Sure, how I got into it. Um, I, I read a, a re review of The Haunting of Hill House, I think it was in Time Magazine, and uh, uh, I rushed up in the uh, uh, bookstore and got a copy of it. Just come out, and I was sitting. Um, I was so interesting. I was sitting in my office, reading it. I was in one of those kind of really hair-raising scenes, you know. <laughs> and right, 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 this, and, and Nelson Gidney, the screenwriter, who was working on something else, when came bursting in my office, I jumped up like that. You know? and I said, "My God, if that, if that could, if that could do to me, me to just reading it, that ought to make a hell of a picture." You know? And that's what got me interested in, in, in doing it. Did you did you talk to Shirley Jackson at all? We what character back. she must have been. Yeah, she was. She was the type of uh, Vermont. 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 Yeah. We went back to see her because we had a couple of three ideas and questions we wanted to ha ask her about the about the project and what she was getting at. Me. And uh, in the course of our of our this is done for myself. We flew back to see her. And in the course of our discussion, we, uh, we we were not too happy with the haunting of Hill House because it's kind of sounded familiar. And we said to her, "Did you uh, did you ever consider any other title for the haunting?" So the only other thing I thought about was uh, maybe just the haunting. So she gave us the title. We did. It was there under our nose in front of us. We didn't see it. I'm not so sure that any of her books had been filmed. I'm not sure. She, at that point. She was, what, what was the very famous short story? The Lottery. Story? The Lottery. I don't think that was ever filmed. Mm -hmm. It finally was. I don't know. Great American Short yeah. Story, I think. Is that what it was? Yeah. yeah. It's a very famous story. Yeah. Gosh, I, I'm such a big fan of hers. Do you have any recollections of what she was like to talk to? Oh, she was a, well, she was a very large lady. Yeah. That, you know, what she did, her husband was a professor. Yeah. At, uh, Hyman, Stanley Edgar Hyman yeah, at Bennington. Yeah, at, uh, at uh, Bennington, that's right. And so we went to see her. She was a rather large, big woman. Uh, very pleasant, very nice. And we had a nice, nice time with her, nice lunch. And then uh, uh, we... we uh, I had a couple of questions I forgot what about her attendant but what she was getting at that she answered and then the best thing that came out of it was the fact that uh, she gave us the time. Did she express obvious pleasure in having a work of hers filmed? Yes, I think she was pleased to have it. Uh, I never did hear from her about what she thought of the film when it was done. I never got any, any kind of uh, word from her about hmm. her reaction to the film. Mm -hmm. Maybe she was not happy with it. You know? I suppose not all writers would be yeah all that happy to have their work filmed. I don't know. Have you ever run into any of those? No. They I all suppose, enjoy <laughs> I suppose, you see, she probably, uh, she probably, all right, will miss things that she couldn't possibly put in the books. So you do. So you have to boil down and condense and pull together uh, all the materials that there's just too much material in a, in a, in a, in a, in a decent-sized book for a two-hour movie. You know? And maybe, uh, maybe they just, uh, maybe she saw the film and just missed some of the stuff that was in the book mm -hmm. that we couldn't accomplish it. A courageous thing, I think, that the lesbian overtones are still very much implicit. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're kind of there. We had, I think I've mentioned this before, we did have another sequence at the beginning of the picture where, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, Claire Bloom. Claire Bloom uh, was yelling out a window to some to a woman down in a, in a car. Over, Vertical was open and something and yelled something at right, her. And then girl, and then um, there was one of the mirrors and I hate you or something like that. And kind of gave a hint.
hint of the, mm -hmm. a matter of fact, too much of a hint of the lesbian thing, so we, we cut that sequence out because it seemed to foreshadow what was going to develop later on. Mm -hmm. Well, you are the man who edited Citizen Kane. Uh, <laughs> I sure am. I'll, I'll, well. I'll do that for life. <laughs> somewhere, yeah. somewhere near here, the film is showing at yeah, a theater. Yeah, As, I, I went down to introduce it the other night. Uh -huh. I was really down here on Wilshire Boulevard. Yeah, I know. Uh, they asked me if I would mind coming down and, and talking a little bit to the audience there. And I did. Answered some questions. Does the day go by that you don't think of Orson? Oh, yes. I, I, there were a few days go by, but I tell you, he was, he was tremendous. When you think about Citizen Kane, it was his first film, he was 25 years old, and that is quite remarkable. Yeah. I think he was as close to genius as anybody I've met in the business in those early days. He was absolutely brilliant. Were you ever regarded as an outsider because you were not a part of the Mercury? No, no, you no, no, no. Uh, There's an interesting story how I came to be on the film. Uh, I got a call. I just finished editing a film, a show being called uh, My Favorite Wife, Carrie Grant and I had done. And I got a call from my boss, Mr. Jimmy Wilkinson, on Monday morning to the over the office scene. And he said, you know about this fellow Orson Welles? Uh, uh, you know? I said, well, yeah, I know about him. I, I, uh, I uh, know about his reputation in New York, his stage work that he did there, and of course the radio broadcast that scared the nation half to death. Uh, why, what's up? He said, well, you know, they've signed into a contract here at the studio, and uh, He's pulled a fast one on the studio. Uh, so what do you mean a fast one? Well, he got an okay from the studio to shoot three what he said were going to be tests for this new film that he wants to make. And uh, they gave him an okay to go ahead and he shot them and they looked at them and they realized they're not they're not just test scenes, they're sequences for the picture act. One of them was that was that little the projection thing with the regular yeah. And so they've given him go ahead, since he's got to sneak the start of it, they, they go ahead and he wants a new editor. My boss had signed a a fairly hack editor to it, and I guess over with it somebody younger, more his own age. And uh, RKO had a studio down in, uh, in Culver City then called RKO Pathé, and he was shooting down there. So I went down to see him about uh, the editing job, and uh, he was actually he was shooting the thing under the beach in the tent and over down there. So the first time I went to told his assistant I was there to see him, and the first time I met Orson he was in the old man makeup. <laughs> And uh, so I talked to him for a few minutes, and uh, I had a good list of credits by that time as an editor. And he said he liked the fact I guess we were. Jim was young, was about the same age. We he was even six months older or six months younger than I. So uh, I got back to the studio in Hollywood. I was in Ghana and got a call half hour later saying I had the job. Well, as you said, you did have a good track record, but had you ever seen film the likes of which passed through your fingers day to day? You couldn't, you couldn't see those, the, 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 the material coming through each day of the cutting room, the rushes. We, we were just eagerly waiting every day that, that we in the cutting room to see the rushes because they were so unusual and extraordinary. Of course, all the actors that we had never seen before, and the marvelous, uh, marvelous the camera work of, uh, what's his name? Uh, yeah, Greg Tolan. Greg Tolan. Mm -hmm. Marvelous camera work, and those two great angles he had, you know. On the floor up here, all the ceilings all over and everything. And all that. And you couldn't, uh, you couldn't see that uh, coming in every day, and not realize you're getting something quite extraordinary. Yeah. And you, of all people, can attest to the scrupulousness of Mankiewicz's script. Yes, yeah, sure. There's sure. no doubt in your mind that his was a substantial contribution. Oh, I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. But Orson, Orson, those days was, was really, was really brilliant. There's no question about it. As opposed, I said, opposed to the genius as anybody I've met in the business. Describe to me your feelings when you find yourself editing film that was not shot by him to get Ambersons finished. Yeah, well, it wasn't much. And, and you were actually shooting some of that, were you not? Just a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we took Ambersons out for a sneak preview. I think it was, I don't know where the first one was in Pasadena. We had terrible problems. We had bad previews, terrible previews on Magnus and Ambersons. Audiences didn't like it. They walked out in droves. They laughed a lot of it. They had laughs at the Aggie Moorhead character. And it was just, it was just terrible. I can't imagine you go out in the film for a sneak preview and think you've got another classic coming on and have the audience just not like it a bit. And uh, so we had to start working on it. It was a long film, about two hours and 40 minutes or something, I think. And we had to cut it down and it would take some hours and then we took it out for another preview. It was a little better, but still people walking out not liking it. And then we finally, we had to, after the preview had cut so much, we had a continuity problem, so we needed a, 
uh, a, a little scene between uh, uh, Georgie and his mother, Rose Costello, and, uh, in her bedroom. Yeah. And so I, I uh, Orson was in South America by this time, working on that with the Brazilians as part of our good neighbor policy to keep South America on our side during the war. So uh, I, I, I directed that scene. And, and so Jim Holden and his mother, Doris Costello, in her bedroom. And then we needed a new, uh, a new, uh, a new ending uh, on, the, on the film. And uh, I, I didn't do that. Freddie Fleck, the production manager, did. It was the same content, but just put it in different locales, I recall. Did Wells ever have comments for you about how all of that finally transpired? Well, I was, I was, uh, I was, um, I was all set to take a print down to him in, in Rio, and just about a day or two before I was to leave, I, uh, I, the, the uh, government put an embargo on any civilians flying out of the country during the war. I wasn't in the service, and uh, so I, I couldn't go. I had to send the print down to him, and then I. I had at one time uh, years ago. I had a 37-page cable from him about changes he wanted to do, and then we had a few. We had a few uh, uh, long, not long distance in those days, not very satisfactory transatlantic uh, phone calls, transpacific, I guess, uh, about the changes. And uh, I was working with his uh, his associate producer, Jack Moss, in the studio. We were making the changes, and, uh, and uh, as uh, he requested, and just that and the other, and then. Uh, after a period of time, the studio was getting uh, was getting uh, anxious about what they had because they had a lot of money in this film. In fact, for that time, that's when we took it out the previews and had the problems with it. Pretty heady stuff for yeah. you. Hardly 25 yourself. Yeah, yeah. and uh, but uh, there's no question it was it was a better picture. It was full length, but it just was it was a better timing. You see, by the time the picture came out, because uh, we were shooting the picture when Pearl Harbor happened. And so by the time the picture came out for previews in, in March or something like that, the, the whole, whole country was geared up for the war effort. You know, guys were going off to training camp, women were working in the aircraft factory, liberty ships were being built. The whole country was just all geared up for the war effort. And they just didn't have any, any sympathy or feeling or understanding or caring about the problems of the Anderson's family in the Annapolis at the turn of the century. It was just a matter of time. It had to come out, of, had to come out the year before, I think it might have been. I mean, incomplete as it is, or flawed as it is, hardly a better literary adaptation I know of. Back to that topic again. Remember the last time you saw Mr. Wells? No. Hmm? Yeah. Anything you want to add, Frank? I think we've this taken your quite a lot of your time. I really appreciate this. What I'd like to do is uh, transcribe this and send it back to you, just to make sure nothing's going on in the page that. Uh, Okay. You have a, a quibble with, you know, sure. and I'll get that to you probably within the next two weeks. I'll be here. And then uh, I might just give you a call, or if you could write me back, yay or nay. Sure. Or sure. Like Absolutely. Okay. Frank, why don't you feed the...